Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 17th to the 23rd of February. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. So, what have we got in store for us this week? This week, the planets are still the stars of the show, but we can also see an asteroid on its way to a beehive. The moon reaches last quarter and visits a teapot, and we've got a couple of gorgeous open clusters and a planetary nebula to hunt for. Intriguing as always. So please do let us know what's going on. Well, this week we have all of the planets apart from Mercury visible in our evening sky. This we're kind of getting to last chance saloon for Saturn, though. That is the one that's going to set first. We're seeing about mag plus 0.8, so it's still fairly bright, but it lies in Aquarius and is now very low in the western twilight and sets at 6.45 p.m. I'm already noticing the lighter evenings and it's making me sad, so it's not long before that is going to be lost. So try to grab Saturn while you still can. It is the astronomer's dilemma. The summer's coming. Well, spring is coming at this point. The days are getting longer, so that means the nights are getting shorter. It's a bit warmer when you're out observing, but it does mean you don't have as long to observe. So it's what we have to deal with. Yeah, you just have to stay up later to do any imaging as well, which I don't enjoy. So (laughs) So, I think I was a a mole in a previous life. I love the dark nights. (laughs) Venus is currently still at mag minus 4.5 and Neptune is not far away, 12 degrees below it at mag plus 7.9. Both of them are in Pisces. Neptune is setting around 8 p.m. and Venus is remaining visible till 9.15 p.m. Through this week, if you have a look at Venus on Monday the 17th and then again on Saturday the 22nd, you will see that the phase of Venus changes from 25% crescent on Monday down to a 20% crescent on Saturday. And if you've got a a decent sized telescope, you should be able to see that it changes from 40 arc seconds in diameter to 44 arc seconds in diameter. So it's actually brighter than it was last week, even though the phase is more slender. And as we talked about last week, the nearer Venus is to us, the brighter it is, even though less of it is illuminated. And you can really see the change in phase this week by 5%. So make sure you do go out and have a look at that on Monday and again at the end of the week. Uranus is currently lying between Taurus and Aries. That is mag plus 5.7, so you will need binoculars or a telescope. Sets around 1.10am, so there's quite a lot of opportunity to look for that before it sets Jupiter is currently at mag minus 2.4. It lies in Taurus and sets around 2.50 p.m. On Monday the 17th at 7 o'clock, we have Europa and Callisto and Ganymede forming a curious triangle shape on the left of Jupiter. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The Galilean moons don't always necessarily follow a straight line pattern when viewed from Earth. It depends on where we are in Jupiter's orbital plane, essentially. So having this really interesting triangle on the left with Io halfway between that and Jupiter itself is a really kind of interesting shape to look for and one that I don't think I've seen before. So definitely look for that on Monday at 7 p.m. And also on Monday the 17th at 7.45, you'll be able to see a mag plus 11.9 star emerge from the bottom right-hand limb of Jupiter. So we don't see it disappearing behind the planet, but you will see it come back out again. So that's a faint star, but if you have a telescope, you should be able to see it emerge from behind Jupiter. Okay, Mars is currently at mag minus 1.1, so that is also very bright over in Gemini, and that is visible all night long and doesn't set until 6 o'clock in the morning. Plenty of opportunity to have a look at Mars and hopefully pick out some of the surface features. It's got a great angular diameter at the moment, and it's very high in our sky, which makes it perfect for observation. 
Mercury is still lost in the sun's glare this week, but by the end of next week, you should see Mercury return to the evening skies. I was beginning to feel a bit sorry for Mercury. He's been a bit left out lately. He has. Talking about all the other planets and they're fabulous and you can see them and they're wonderful. And then Mercury is also somewhere. Yeah, he's joining the parade in a couple of weeks. So hang in there, Mercury. You'll Just soon as Saturn be with us. nods off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know Mercury is one that is more challenging to see because it is always low down, but it can be very bright when it's well placed. So don't write Mercury off as too challenging. It is quite easy to see when you know where to look. Yeah, it's it's a bit tricky. You have to worry about the sun and things like that, but he's still there. (laughs) Yeah, very much so. We have an asteroid 28 Bologna, which is currently at mag plus 10.1. That is moving through Cancer this month. And later on in March, it's going to actually pass through the Beehive Cluster. So it would be fun to locate it now so that you can monitor it on its journey towards the Beehive. So mag plus 10.1 is a sort of magnitude where you can pick it up with a fairly modest digital SLR and a lens. So if you take photographs of that now and then just go back and repeat that process over the next few weeks, you'll be able to plot its movement through cancer and then it will be fainter when it goes into the beehive and more challenging to find. But to actually have the asteroid passing through the stars of the beehive, it's obviously not passing through those stars. The distances are very different. It's just a line of sight effect. But it's always fun to see something make a passage through such a beautiful cluster like that. Moving on to the moon, we're going from a waning gibbous to a waning crescent. On Monday the 17th at 6 o'clock in the morning, we have the waning gibbous moon just 3.1 degrees from Spica. Thursday the 20th at 5.30pm, the moon reaches last quarter. It won't be in our skies at that time, but it will rise later on in the night. On Friday the 21st of February at 6am, the moon is just 1.5 degrees from Antares. My brain can't cope with this. I feel like it's just been snowing this week and suddenly we're seeing parts of the claw of Scorpius. And I'm like, how did that happen already? (laughs) It's because they just pop themselves up quite a lot earlier than you think. You know, the constellations are around for longer than people sort of really appreciate them for. They do, yeah. They rise It's like just before dawn that that's rising. So it's not like it's visible in the evening, but it still kind of blows my mind a bit when something you just associate with summer is above the horizon again. It's because they're usually around, like you can see them at some point in the night for about six months. Yeah, sometimes more depending on how high the constellation is. But on Sunday the 23rd of February at 6am again, the waning crescent moon is going to sit above the spout of the teapot. Something else I associate with warm summer's nights and Milky Way observing, but very, very low in the sky and just before dawn. So make sure you look out for that. That is the teapot asterism. Yes, part of Sagittarius. While we've got a waning moon, it means that the evening sky is free of light pollution from the moon. So it's a really good time to have an explore around Canis Major. So the binocular tour in the current issue of Sky at Night magazine actually has a look around Canis Major and Monoceros. And there are a couple of clusters that are quite easy to look for with binoculars. Messier 46 and 47, they're actually in the same field of view with 10 by 50 binoculars, and it's unusual to have two clusters that are visible at the same time. They both lie about five degrees south of the Mag plus 3.9 star Alpha Monocerotus. You should resolve about six stars in Messier 47. Messier 46 is larger and has more stars, but it's actually further away. So they appear to be around about the same size. But because of the being more distant, it's very difficult with binoculars to actually resolve any of the stars themselves in M46. You will see the glow. And if you use averted vision, you will definitely spot that there is something there. You just may not see like actual stars with those sorts of powers of binoculars. If you have more magnification, then you will start to resolve those stars. And if you have a larger telescope of more than 150 millimetres, you will actually see about 75 stars in M46. It's actually a good exercise of looking at it with both, if you have both, and just see what a difference that extra resolving power will give you. So averted vision, for people who don't know, is when you don't look directly at the thing you're trying to look at. You look at it with your peripheral vision. That is because your central vision, 
is designed for very fine things. It's got lots of colour recognition and, and so on like that. Whereas your periphery is much better at doing things like light and dark. And when you're trying to look at very faint points of light of stars in a constellation or something like this, then actually using that peripheral vision, that sort of light and dark part of your vision. I can never remember which one, whether it's cones or rods, which one does the colour. I think cones do the colour and rods do the brightness. And you've got more rods on the edge of your vision. And so that's why it's better to try and look just off to the side. Yeah, you see it more in monochrome as well. And especially with some of these deep sky objects, the colours are not as apparent to the naked eye anyway. But the first time you play around with averted vision, it's just, just a mind-blowing difference in how faint an object can be that you can see when you're not looking straight at it. It is quite an unusual one. And it's a, an absolutely essential skill to master because you do need to use it quite a lot with visual astronomy. And it's a very odd experience that you're so used to normally in life you look directly at something and that's how you focus on it and it's sort of everything that's going on around you is quite blurry or just not really in focus then you look through a telescope and the opposite happens and it's a bit weird <laughs> but as you said an important skill it is and it, but it's a really useful skill and actually on that subject, again, with visual stuff, if you do have a larger telescope and you're looking at M56, there's actually a planetary nebula that lies within that cluster. It's NGC 2438. It's 1,370 light years away. And it's got a disk size of about one arc minute. So it's very, very small. But if you have a larger telescope, you will see the shape better. And one thing that you can do for looking at faint things like planetary nebulae is to use an oxygen three filter. And when you put that in front of the eyepiece, you will basically have the stars kind of dim right down and the planetary nebula will pop out. So it's a really useful filter to have for these faint fuzzies like this and particularly things like planetary nebulae so that is actually within m46 so there's quite a lot to see within those clusters with different magnifications if you have access to that and that filter technique works because oxygen 3 is one of the gases that make up nebula and so it lets the light that's coming from that glowing oxygen comes through the filter but the rest of the starlight doesn't it blanks it out it dims all of the bits that you're not trying to look at and brings out at least some of the gases in that nebula and really makes them pop. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really useful thing to have for visual astronomy, but also imaging. And these clusters and that planetary nebula are a beautiful photography target if you are into imaging. Absolutely. All the finder charts for these objects are in the current issue of the magazine, by the way, in the binocular tour. So that, that's a really useful guide for other things that you can see with binoculars. And finally, the International Space Station returns to the early morning skies for some nice passes this week. So if you're a space station spotter, you'll have to get up early to have a look for that. So some really great things to be seeing in the night sky this week. And thank you very much for taking us through all of those, Mary. If our listeners at home want to keep up to date with even more stargazing highlights, please do subscribe to the Star Diary podcast, where we'll be back here next week with even more tips. But to summarise this week again, all of the planets are visible after sunset this week, apart from Mercury, but Saturn is now setting quite early, so do catch that before it leaves. All week, you can see asteroid 28 Bologna as it's passing through Cancer on its way to a close encounter with a beehive cluster next month. On Monday the 17th of February, at 6am, the moon lies close to the star speaker. At 7pm, the Galilean moons have an interesting formation to the left of Jupiter. And at 7.45pm, watch out for a mag plus 11 star emerging from behind Jupiter. On Thursday the 20th of February, the moon reaches last quarter. On Friday the 21st of February, at 6am, the moon lies 1.5 degrees from the star Antares in Scorpius. On Saturday the 22nd of February, before the moon rises, look for the open cluster M46 and M47 and the more challenging planetary nebula NGC 2438. On Sunday the 23rd at 6am, the moon lies just above the spout of the teapot. And finally, the ISS is returning to the dawn skies this week, so keep an eye out for that 
I'll put a note in the show notes below about how you can keep up with and track the ISS if you would like more information on that. But that's it from us for this week. I'll be back next week with Katrin Rayner, who will be telling us about even more stargazing highlights. But from all of us here, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.